much uh, for the kind words and the, the introduction. I'm not sure if some of you get the feeling that uh, you were invited to a party just to hear me speak. Um, so it was a little awkward when, we, when I was asked to uh, to present. Uh, I said, "Well, it's kind of you know, helping through some of the organization. It's a little weird to say, hey, come over here and hey, hear me the whole time you're here.'" So uh, I'm going to try to keep this uh, marginally short. Uh, I'm going to move through this fairly quickly and give as much time as possible to to Will. So we'll have a little more time than allocated in the agenda. I'm going to spend probably about 25 minutes talking about some of the ways in which networks are making an impact organizationally and in society. Uh, then I will pause for questions as well, so if you have any things that come up that you'd like to have addressed or clarified, we will have time for questions at the end of the session as well. So networks, they're one of these things that all of us know, we live in on a daily basis, we've seen uh, our children or younger kids in school systems, we've seen our colleagues use networks in a variety of ways, sometimes for interesting effects, sometimes for social change. But the sense of being connected now is almost so ubiquitous that we no longer really, it's almost the not being connected that is, that causes us to be conscious of the situation. But to be connected is almost consumed. So when I go into a setting, for example, with the birds here, otherwise, if I can't get a wireless connection, or if I can't get online, it doesn't take long until a little bit of angst starts to stir. Yeah. So that's I mean, just a reality that in a span of probably less than in a decade, we've moved from being connected as a novelty. I still remember the first time when I took a phone and was able to search for movies on a mobile device that was playing in a theater nearby, rather than having to do that on the laptop that was tethered to the connection. This is like 40 years ago, this is probably less than 10 years ago. And I remember that experience of, wow, that is interesting. You know, being connected while I'm in a car, it's fascinating. And now, like I said, the opposite is what fascinates us or irritates us, and the act of being connected really doesn't do much for us at all. So we're seeing, I think, societally, being this broad view where we're shifting from a state of being perhaps disconnected or isolated to one of being continually connected and continually part of the network. And so the things that I want to talk about today then are really several points that first start by giving us a little bit of context. What are some of the change pressures that make the act of being connected or being a part of networks particularly relevant for the education sector. But I'm going to start looking at how are these networks just at a very high level overview of impacting society. This is something that many of you are likely already aware of when you hear of the Arab Spring or similar kinds of results that are produced when individuals are connected and they start getting together on Facebook and Twitter and start trying to drive change, which doesn't always happen, but at least the act is there. The more interesting part, from my end at least, is how does this influence what happens in knowledge development processes and through learning and learning engagement. And then toward the end, I want to spend a little bit of time just thinking about the shift organizationally. What does this mean to the structures of society, the big structures that we're a part of, such as university systems, such as corporations, such as schools. So that's sort of the, the tail end of the event, and I'll talk a little more about how do big systems change and what does that mean so for starters, let's talk a little bit about context. We're in a very interesting period in time, and I guess everybody who's at any period in time feels that they're an interesting period of time because it's their first time there. But um, a few of the things that are, are really putting us in a, in a point of reflection, and this is why we're here to look at 2030, relates to what's happening around the employment and labor. Now, the university system is not there to produce people for the workforce. That's not the primary intent of the university. I remember hearing an interesting quote that said the role of education, the role of higher education, is to make people who are privately happy and publicly useful. And I think that kind of a concept is, is there, that there's the sense in which education is not just about employment, it's about the stage of becoming and becoming a different or a better person. That goes right down through uh, the K-12 sector into the university and ultimately some of the big takers of MOOCs, if you are individuals who are not what you would look at somebody seeking a degree. Their age group is well advanced with traditional sequential students, and many of them already have a bachelor's or a master's degree when they're taking moves. So this, there's this type of learning that we do for personal value and personal benefit. But our economy and the fact that we're employed is kind of an important part of our lives, which means that even though the primary role of education might not be to prepare people for employment exclusively, it certainly is an important aspect that we can't ignore, meaning that the university system, the college system, has to provide opportunities.
opportunities for the learners within the system. And it really should be about the learners' opportunities. I think the Premier made a very interesting point that I haven't heard made before about you know, maybe it's the employers that aren't ready for our students rather than the other way around the way it's sometimes passed. Nonetheless, we're entering a period where our work is going to be fairly different than what we see today. Recently on a panel several weeks ago, uh, Bill Gates made a statement that we're going to see up to 50% of what we currently have in the labor market today, those jobs, up to 50%, will be replaced by automated agents, robots, or whatever else you want to call it. That's a fairly dramatic change. We're also seeing in terms of the growth of knowledge work, and this is a trend that goes back to the Market Prosperity Institute did a report about four years ago where they looked at how did the global economy change in terms of employment. Whereas 100, 120 years ago, the majority of the economy was related to either agricultural work or the growing uh, amount of work was industrial or factory oriented work. And today, that's essentially flipped. So the vast majority of our economy today is either knowledge or knowledge related work, or it is in something that we would describe as being service or service oriented activity. So as a result, we have a very different type of a context that our employees are graduating into. They're not graduating into an industrial model necessarily. Some may still at certain levels, but more and more they're moving to something that looks like knowledge related work. And this is evidence in the economy in, in the developed regions of the world as well. So if you look at the US economy, which somewhat maps to the Canadian economy, interaction and transaction jobs. So this would be knowledge related work or service oriented work. Now, results in about 80, 85% of the economy being in that type of work. Whereas production work, the more routine labor that perhaps was the majority as little as 100 years ago, has now been reduced to about 15% of the market overall. Economies that are less developed or less diversified still have more of a traditional production-oriented look, but even in those cases, those numbers are starting to change quite quickly. So really the nature of work is not what it was in the past, and it means that the university system in particular, the school system looking back at the K-12 sector, which, which we will address that aspect more so in this talk, but the K-12 system similarly needs to recognize that it's not just that learners are different in their use of technology, but the lives that they're going to be living in terms of continual ongoing learning and the way in which knowledge is going to be used in their learning process is going to be a significant factor. One of the more interesting things is that we don't hear about as much is the diversifying profile of students. Now, this is a higher education lens that I'm addressing this from. So, the, the students that we had in the past were considered essentially sequential students. So, you, you graduate out of high school, you move into the university sector or into the college sector. You get a degree and then you end up uh, in whatever type of work you, you uh, wanted to get into. The students today now are much more diverse than what they were even a decade. There is through, if you look at the number of students, less than 50% are now what's traditionally defined as full-time students. These are students that are going to university as their primary activity. Increasingly, students are returning either in terms of reskilling or getting new opportunities to learn through the marketplace, or they've had their job automated or they have themselves been rendered obsolete, so to speak. As a result, we have a very diverse student profile, and this profile is something that the broad education sector by 2030 needs to account for. First of all, there is, and has been for a period of time now, a dramatic increase in female participation in the education sector over, uh, in terms of the number of students over men. More and more students are attending university from a percentage level. So if you have the university system in the U.S. in the 1930s where you're educating 15 to 20 percent of your students, you have a different type of support structure that's needed for that student base, because you may likely have the top performing students in the system that have aspirations for higher education. Students that aren't interested in that likely just enter the workforce directly. When you start approaching 50 to 60% of your population involved in some level of post-secondary education, numbers that a few regions of the world, such as Canada and Israel are part of, once you start to approach those kinds of numbers, all of a sudden you have an entirely different range of student support services that are required. Because your students are not necessarily there because they love learning and they're, they're, this is something they, they enjoy. They're there because they see it as, I need to get that in order to get that kind of a job. So it's more of a utilitarian focus, which means you have different support <coughs> structures that are required to encourage them, guide them, support them, and so on. The uh, growth of international education is another significant factor. 
in Canada as well, Ontario made this uh, several years ago a bit of a priority where they wanted to draw in a greater number of students from in order to compensate for falling enrollment numbers due to demographic shifts within Canada. And so the way they were going to fill that demographic gap was through international students. And that's growing competition uh, really globally from China to uh, US, UK, Australia, Spain, with some of the regional uh, numbers where students are coming or going to for their education. But the largest student populations are China, India, and US. And of course, traditional science course is something that you don't hear as much because there's such a heavy emphasis on STEM and STEM areas, but actually those traditional courses are waning and a lot of the more applied courses, MBA or related courses, are the ones that are growing in popularity. So what we end up then is this complexification of the education system. And that means that the university and the school system, and even in corporate learning context, I just had a call uh, uh, two days ago, I spoke with uh, the training developer lead with uh, General Electric, and she was mentioning that in their organization, the biggest focus that they have, the biggest concern that they have, is how do we begin to change our development process for learners who aren't working with us the way that our previous generation of learners did. And what she meant by that was they, they have a completely different range of opinions and expectations on what the company should do for them. They have a different approach to how they might want to connect or collaborate with others. Or one of the, the favorite statements about that generation came from when I was the U.S. Navy had a report out. They took it down about a day after. But this was in 2005, and it said that this generation of students are coddled, narcissistic praise junkies. Uh, <laughs> but I guess that didn't go over well, so they took the slides down. But it was that sense of Virginia as well, in the corporate sectors, there's this real concern about what is it that we need to do in order to make this group of employees that are coming in effective at doing the kind of work that we're expecting them to do, but we have to recognize that they perhaps interact and engage with each other in a different way. So with, in the university system as a whole, the single narrative of you're a 17 to 25 year old student going to university isn't accurate. Certainly in a system like Athabasca University, it's never been terribly accurate, but even regular or traditional university systems, I'll say, are experiencing that demographic shift, and OEC data supports as well that, that the age of entering university has advanced uh, up to about 26 years of being average in some regions of the world. And as a result, this general idea of learning is expanding and diversifying what's happening in classrooms or in a university no longer captures the full scope of the kinds of things that we need to do there. Additionally, we're seeing a granularization of learning where things are becoming smaller and smaller, and that means that we're seeing a range of new approaches being generated in order to manage that experience. We see a granularization of learning where the U.S. in particular competency-based learning is gaining significant traction. Uh, in uh, Wisconsin, for example, they recently initiated a degree program where you could do your full degree, never having step, full bachelor's, never having step into the university classroom or having taken a university course. The entire thing could be done through competency-based learning. Uh, some of you may uh, be familiar with the Southern New Hampshire University, which is getting a lot of attention in the U.S. Anyone that's randomly interested, it looks as, as a not-for-profit, but the key is it is a not-for-profit that's wrapped around by a for-profit. So it's very much for-profit, but you never hear that. Anyway, that's what I'm So um, the, there's an example, though, with that kind of a system, where it is uh, students are saying, the, I can't take time out of my life to go to university to get a degree, and then do whatever I need to do. So there's a sense of flexibility and flexible approaches that come through competency-based learning, prior learning assessment, and related approaches that just recognize that learning doesn't have to happen in the space that the university or higher education system holds. Also seeing this happen in terms of assessment, from badging to badging approaches to, in the U.S., probably the biggest threat, or the big because of the way in which student loans are tied to funding or to uh, the credit hour, uh, once the credit hour breaks apart, then you, 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 the whole university system starts to take a very different look and approach. And recently, there was some recognition of funding being made available with competency-based degrees as well. But cracking the credit hour is a great overview of the challenge that the U.S. system faces. It's a good report by the New America Foundation around what this might look like and what some of the challenges that might be generated by this approach. And badges as well. You see them now with Mozilla badges, or some folks use the word gamification describe it. It's really about saying, rather than, than saying, George, you've completed Python 101. It's about saying, George, you know how to work with arrays. 
you know how to clean data at a high level. So instead of giving a broad statement of competence, giving a very granular statement of competence. And finally, one of the bigger trends in this regard relates to what's happening in the K-12 sector. Uh, there's not uh, education, I think, is always being in the space. But in the K-12 sector, uh, it's becoming very political and very contested for a variety of reasons, which I, as you might get into your 20, 30 discussions. But essentially, there's the recognition that we are trying to assess and we're trying to measure and we are trying to improve based on set standards that treats every student as having a similar profile around the world. So that student in Alberta needs to be measured against that student in Taiwan, needs to be measured against that student in Norway. And so if you're interested, uh, there's a great video that David Cornyn did for the uh, Open Education Conference in Utah that really attacked me. I tried to articulate what is deliberology. This, it, it, that literally is a word, by the way, and it's actually a word that I would think would have negative connotations. But when I read about it, apparently it doesn't. So, but that's another question the university faces, or not the university, this is K-12, around making better use of the dollars and resources that they have and it's being mandated and articulated in an interesting way that is going to produce some fascinating labor strikes going forward. And then on, on this uh, element here, before I start shifting out into the main end of it, or the network of discussion, is what's happening globally in the learning sector. The fastest growing elements of the learning marketplace relate to digital learning. And whereas the university traditionally, even in developed regions of the world, has slowed in growth or plateaued in some cases, few instances, small declines, but overall, anything that has anything to do with online learning, e-learning, or digital learning is explosive in its growth, continuing to report percentage rates from 25-33% uh, you know, year over year growth rates, which is, which is quite substantial. All right, so that's a little bit of context. So what are networks doing for us? Well, one of the first things to look at is that the biggest lesson, I think, from a network perspective is that we're no longer intelligent in isolation. <coughs> And one of the examples that I think summarizes this, or at least addresses this quite well, at least for me, is this: the, the what happened with SARS in 2003. So when SARS first came out, it was a very vague entity with a concept that we didn't know, didn't understand, and as a result, there's a lot of fear and uncertainty in the process for identifying the coronavirus is causing SARS. Is to me a quintessential knowledge problem of the 21st century. And it was a group of individuals that collaborated with these various virology and research labs around the world that didn't use overwhelmingly complex technologies, basic things like email and information sharing. In the span of less than two months, they were able to identify the coronavirus, which then led to a series of methods that they could manage and guidelines they could provide people to so cure as well some treatment approaches that might be helpful, as well as ways in which to reduce the prospect of this, uh, this spreading. So it's a challenge where through a network system, a group of individuals were able to solve a very complex problem that through traditional scientific methods may well have taken several years. And this structure, it, this network structure, is what's putting a lot of pressure on destabilizing a top-down culture, especially in the university and the school system as well, where we are no longer centrally connected. So a session like this, there's a disproportionate voice of one individual here, which at this point happens to be me. But generally speaking, if you have 100 people in a room, those 100 people can fill one another's knowledge gaps in ways that we don't have a university system that acknowledges. So we're more intelligent as a network than we are as individuals, and these networks will continue to destabilize top-down structures. And we see this with people who take university stats courses, for example, that are backfilling their knowledge through MOOCs, or that are taking OLI courses of introduction, introduction to statistics. Recently did a course at the basket of doctoral students, and uh, one of the students in particular had a bit of a difficulty with, with writing as a second language for this individual, and I ended up recommending that this individual take a, a MOOC on edX as a way as an introduction to college or university writing, which I thought would be well fitted for, for this uh, person. And that simple act, and this is the, something that I sometimes am not conscious enough of, is that simple act of being able to say to someone, here's a resource that is easy and accessible that you can get, that you don't have to for necessarily, other than through your data, that will allow you to be able to engage and fill in some of these, these knowledge challenges you have. So that's just an example of the destabilization effects of the network. And it really is an interesting point in that in our century today, it is difficult to be a control freak. It's very difficult to try and push a message down or to block a message out. We 
because things get out on Twitter. Things, by the way, are hashtag here if anybody cares. It's D L F A B, so Digital Learning Forum cover. But um, so that's a challenge that individuals need to face that the past of being able to control a message through centralization no longer have that ability to control. Now, this does give a voice, but unfortunately that voice doesn't always lead into action. Now some of you may have been following Ivan anyways, the, the incident of uh, the, the dean out of the University of Saskatchewan being dismissed and then eventually being rehired because of the uproar, the provost ended up uh, resigning and then yesterday the president ended up being fired, I guess would be the right word. She didn't resign. And so, there, but it doesn't always work out that way. So, hashtag activism doesn't always result in dramatic change. You know, Coney comes to mind as one example for you may have followed back in 2012. But at minimum, it gives a voice. And there's an interesting effect is that by giving individuals a voice, there's actually a growing field of study around this idea of how do you frame and shape a message in networks in such a way that it has viral attributes, that it gets picked up and shared and reshared by others as it goes forward. One example is Reddit. I've spent an unreasonably health, unhealthy amount of time on Reddit. Uh, but it's a fascinating example of a large scale social process. If I, was, if I was running a new platform, I would spend all my time trying to understand how Reddit works in order to improve social capacities of groups. But so, and a few things that happen on Reddit is it's this active community to easily create and share, to easily participate in a network that allows us then to feel a part of something or be connected to something. Memes are just one example. Means is a term that some people find a little contentious, but it's just this idea that we can transmit culture almost the way that bacteria or an infection can be transmitted. So if you spend any time on meme sites, you'll get uh, uh, you know issues where individuals just try and connect, and it's just a social process. And this is essentially what it is. If someone's saying, hey, I have this experience, and then they decide they want to create a meme, and someone else says, you know what, I passed that same thought. I've never told anybody about it. And so there's this sense in which you begin to resonate and harmonize some thinking and some views. And uh, this approach that individuals take with these kinds of memes or these types of approaches is a, it's an attempt at humor, it's an attempt at resonance, it's an attempt to connect and to share ideas uh, with other individuals. And so finding out how <laughs> ideas and information spread in network structures is an important aspect of this process. And that's what networks do. They create and they alter information flow approaches. More critically, they give control to the individual node in the network rather than a central node within the network. All right, so let's turn a little bit to the uh, learning and the knowledge dimension of it. So in 2004, I wrote a sloppy paper, um, and I called it uh, Connectivism and Learning Theory for the Digital. In retrospect, don't ever call anything a learning theory because no academic ever appears to be able to get past the idea of a learning theory. So <laughs> just call it connectivism and leave it there and you'll have a far easier life. But uh, the arguments that I was putting forward were fairly basic and, and still largely hold true. Uh, first of all, that is that knowledge, and I've already addressed this, but it's essentially a networked and a distributed entity. Knowledge isn't something that exists in my head. It doesn't exist in your head. It's something that exists in the paper that you use around you. It exists in your organization, schemes that you use to make sense of your world. It exists in your friends, in the networks that you're a part of. So your ability to be intelligent, your ability to solve problems, is a function of networks, essentially. Now, it's been quantified in different ways. Mark Granovetter in 72 wrote a paper called The Strength of Weak Ties, meaning that most individuals, the most cited paper in sociology, but the core argument is most individuals, Get their novel information from weak ties because they're strong ties, family and friends, they interact on a regular basis. Weak ties, these are people you might go to school with, they might not talk to for six months, they have novel information. And it's been updated more recently, look at dormant ties. So previously strong connections that became weak because we moved away, they also have novel information. But anyways, it's the sense that we're part of these knowledge systems. And then the experience of learning then is essentially one of forming networks. We'll go into this in much detail, but at three primary levels. The argument I tried to make to those fine social constructivists in our midst is that in a network learning lens, we can articulate net learning at every level without having to transition metaphors or examples to you. Meaning that at a biological level, learning is a network forming process. Olaf Sporn's done work that articulates that the neural connections in the brain are very much map to the hub and weak tie networks that exist in, in society as well. 
Second is conceptual. I'll get onto this in the next set of slides, but it's about idea relatedness. So when we form a concept, physics has done this extensively with concept mapping. When we engage in this topic, ideas are related, how they're connected and related determines really, and how we connect and relate determines the depth of our knowledge. And this is also evident in external networks, namely the social and technological networks that we're a part of. So the same examples of like, uh, node strength, uh, in degree, out degree, centrality, those kinds of concepts exist at a neural, at a conceptual, and at an external level. Now this is happening more and more in a complex, chaotic knowledge landscape, which is what we're in today, which means that problems are not simple cause-effect kind of problems. They're intractable, complex issues that require a fair degree of time to be able to understand and make sense of. And more and more, as I'm sure you're all aware, it's being aided and uh, by technology as a whole. Now by the way, sometimes technology makes it look like an idiot, and it's just random. So uh, I was playing with Google Glass the other day, and uh, I've never been able to bring myself to wear it in public because I'm afraid that I'll look too much like that, I'm an idiot, which I guess I did. But um, I was playing with it, and then I you know, got this thing where you want to reply all, so you talk to this thing. And so I got an email from Cable to me announcing, yay, this happened. And so, you know, there's some important announcement. And he copied, like, I don't know, 20 email lists. And uh, so I was looking at uh, through Glass, looking at my email, and then I said, cancel. And then the thing typed in cancel. And I said, no, cancel, and then it sent. And so my email said cancel. And then Stephen Downs, you know, you at the bottom, of course, Google Glass does this at the bottom and says, sent from my glass. And then, so it looks very much like I'm being this, oh, Google Glass. But it said, so Stephen said, yeah, Google Glass. I said, no, I'm just a total newbie. I didn't know how this thing worked. Anyway, so connectivism, that's what I'm talking about. Now, this reflects a variety of ways. So this, uh, when we look at the structure and the architecture of science, domains of science, they're essentially network entities and network properties. I'm not going to go into great detail on this, but there's a variety of resources that you can dive in to get a better sense of it. Some of the work that Caddy Warner has done from uh, uh, the University of Illinois, I believe it is, around uh, mapping science is spectacular, articulating the field for the domains of science. Now, physics, as I mentioned earlier, they've been extensive made extensive use of things like concept maps. I haven't taught a course, I think, in the last decade where I haven't forced students to use concept maps. Because I'm interested in how, I'm not interested so much in can you name nodes, I'm interested in do you understand how nodes are related to each other, and does that relate with what actually exists? So one field, for example, there's a report <coughs> in a video that I frequently reference, it's called Private Universe. And in this video, they ask a group of Harvard students, on graduation day, why do we have seasons? Smartest people in the world, best university system in the world, most successful American corporation, and individuals, 21 out of 23 students, were unable to identify the reason for seasons. Most of them felt it had to do with proximity of the Earth uh, to the Sun, rather than the accurate answer, which is the tilt of the Earth's axis. To me, that's an example of making it through the education system with something I would think you would learn in grade four or five, and yet you were able to graduate with this, which means that the system never began learners to make explicit the connections that they form in these subject areas. And so it's a huge fail, but that's what concept mapping allows us to do, is to see how things are, are connected and structured. In a network sense, through science as well, uh, it's how we evaluate knowledge disciplines, the development of fields like molecular uh, biology, or the ways in which we look at collaborations from academic peers, the, the image on, on your right, how different co-author networks are formed in systems. So through networks and network plans, we're able to understand and make sense of how the world is broadly connected and how scientific domains are connected, and more and more through things like link data, semantic web, uh, Google's knowledge graph project, we start to see machines, I guess, if you will. Because essentially, link data and the semantic web is not for people, it's for technology, but it's to be able to remove the ambiguity that comes out of our social conversation interaction and produce a network image or a network effect. Also interesting, one play the interesting tools called Meta Academy. It allows you to articulate the concept architecture of particular topics or ideas. So you search for something, it'll lay out how that particular topic area is mapped or not. So from a learning end, uh, lens, then all of this relates to something that looks like participatory pedagogy, which means that at a really at any level of the education process, from and Carl Breyer and Marlene Scarmelia have been particularly good at articulating this, where they emphasize that. Even at a young age, even the K-12 student system shouldn't be about knowledge duplication. It should be about knowledge generation, knowledge creation. Individual learners should be creating knowledge at the youngest age rather than expecting, oh, you know, K-12, they, 
they tend to generate all these data to learn what we know. Uh, their articulation, I think, very well argued, is that that process of being engaged in original knowledge production is available to anyone who's willing to sit down and follow a bit of a process or a way to think through complex subject areas. University levels, I think, this idea of peer instruction. Eric Mazur, who's uh, what is he, a physicist, I think, at, at, uh, at Harvard, he won the Minerva Prize, I guess, just this week, which is five hundred thousand dollars, and his work in peer instruction. He makes a lot of money traveling, lecturing at people about peer instruction. But the general idea is that we can do a lot in networks by teaching one another. There's actually a very solid basis for this. If you look at the literature in experts and expertise, novices are sequential thinkers, meaning they or they, they, the way they approach the topic is step one, step two, step three. Experts are pattern thinkers. And this is well communicated through individuals like Gary Klein and, uh, and others that have done, uh, Carl Weick and uh, Brendan Durbin, and people have done work in how people uh, advance or experts think. And experts think primarily in patterns, which is odd because if we want to make experts out of our learning process, we really need to teach them in pattern-forming ways, which is primarily simulations, case studies, group-based interaction. Sequential learning actually is really good at producing novices. And much of our education or design system is about step one, step two, step three. So heavily scaffolded approach. We really need to move something that's more participatory in nature or structure. And just to sort of begin wrapping this section up a little bit, much of this is a slide I've used for several years, but much of what we've done in the past is this broad idea of teacher content learners and the structure of the world today is quite different where, and I mean, now you throw in MOOCs and you throw in other you know, open education resources and suddenly you have a situation where the faculty is no longer the central node in the learning experience. The faculty or the teacher is still an important node and still a critical node, but not necessarily the central node because we can do a lot for ourselves what faculty or teachers used to do for themselves. For us, I should say. And one of the projects that I've uh, been involved in is led by uh, colleague Terry Anderson and John Duran at Athabasca is uh, the landing. And the landing is a great example of how do universities begin to encourage learners to make sense of different topic areas or different ideas through networks and through network systems. And can you give the learners control? Because not every learner, and I, I've had experience this as well, not every learner can say, hey, Go on the open web, it's wonderful out here. We can tweet and we can do stuff. It will be great. And um, it doesn't always work that way because learners have different levels of comfort, they have different levels of expressing themselves. And as a faculty or as a teacher, you can't impose your standard of identity formation on learners. They have to define that for themselves. I had one case with a student that I said, Oh, you should blog, it would be great. That also that encouraged her to communicate. I had made a part of that course, the English mentor at the time. And she ended up emailing to table. She had a restraining order against the partner, and the list goes on. And, and there's no way she could reveal her identity. And so, so suddenly, I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, your personal context exceeds my desire to philosophize about social media. So the reality <laughs> is that the landing is an opportunity for what Athabasca is using it for, at least where you have varying levels of shareability for private, personal, small group. It's basically the internet in the box, for lack of a better word, but it gives the support structure that learners need when they're first developing their competence in this space. So everything is using blogs to, to uh, Twitter-like functionality with the wire and so on. And it gives individuals a lot of opportunity to control the kind of information that they encounter by how they filter. Because a key skill in an information abundant age is the capacity to filter domains of information in a way that doesn't make you go nuts. Because the most important thing, when you've got an overwhelming amount of information, it's articulating what are the important elements. What are the elements that actually Final point, how does all of this then impact the structure of schools, universities, and even corporate learning departments going forward? Manuel Castell has written, I think, one of the better papers I've seen on this, and I can't uh, encourage you enough if you're interested in the idea of how networks create power, is to look at his paper on network theory of power. And he looks at various attributes of power structures that arise out of networking, you know, namely the the ability to form networks is a type of power. Once you form the network, it's the, it's the power structure. Uh, and a range of other factors that essentially say, if you want to understand power in today's day and age, if you understand control and influence, you really need to understand networks and how networks articulate and shape that power. This is relevant because a system is essentially a, a connective structure. 
and a system like the university, like the K-12 school system. It's a connective structure that's been hardened to achieve a particular task. And as a colleague uh, mentioned John John earlier, he's done a lot of thinking on this. And his statement is uh, that hard is soft and soft is easy, which is basically the sense that uh, if you can make something structured as a system, you can then determine set outcomes regularly. If you have a soft system like social processes, they're very difficult to manage because individuals do things that you can't anticipate. So it's very difficult to have those kinds of social systems. And so within our university system, and this is critical for the final couple points I want to make here, but within the university system, the value really is in lock-in and integration. We've had an end-to-end -end lock in integration in the past, especially with the, the uh, higher education system. That's sort of being pulled apart with a variety of, of uh, different agents. It could be venture capitalists, the startup economy. It could be the for-profit sector. It could be publishers and other providers that are trying to open up the education system because it is, in uh, the words of the famous humanitarian, Murdoch, one of the last fields <laughs> to fully globalize. And that means there's enormous profit taking potential in, the, in this landscape. He looks a bit like that, actually. So in 2001, uh, you probably recall Apple released uh, the iPod, which, you know, for Apple lovers, generated a bit of fanfare, but uh, it didn't have huge adoption. Things really started to change in 2003 when Apple released iTunes, and particularly when they released iTunes uh, for Windows was the turning point for Apple. It's probably one of the primary decisions that generated the Apple that we know today. 2005, they added on a few things like TV shows, music videos, and so on. 2007, we get the iPhone. This process is a terrific example of value generation and value lock-in through network systems. Because at this stage, Apple owns the experience end-to-end, -end. there's significant competition, you could argue, from Android, but that competition doesn't seem to hurt Apple's $130 billion cash reserves that it's sitting on. And, but the, each time you add a new node or agent in a network, you increase the soft lock-in of that network. What I mean with that is that as you add an additional resource, learners or individuals are less inclined to leave you. So if you just have an iPhone, if you just have a Motorola, if you just have a Nokia with no app store, with no movies, no videos, no $5,000 song library that you can purchase, you're an easy customer for a switch. But a soft lock-in is one that you have best interest you. In. The reason, remember we have Plurk. Does anybody recall Plurk? Twitter used to die all the time. You get the fail whale uh, back in uh, 2007, 2008. And then a group of people were outraged and they went to Plurk. And there was no one there. And so they went back to Twitter and continued to be outraged on Twitter. But uh, the reality was that if you're in a soft, locked-in network, either through social or through other investment, you're not leaving. And that's one of the big benefits of the university system where you've got alums, where you've got other opportunities where you're part of that system. So in, a, in an education or a knowledge and learning structure, we're starting to see a battle unfold now that is trying to make that network not locked in anymore and open it up to competitive or in some cases for profit motives. And so you end up now with a battle for freedom and control in the network world where it's surprising that there's a group of uh, the, the interest as things fragment, we move to greater individual control, but we also move to greater tightened control by the key organizations that are part of that network or part of that system. And in some cases, universities that haven't gotten up to speed on the role of technology or that haven't built internal capacity to participate in these new digital networks that are forming, they're investing enormous dollars trying to stay current and relevant. And uh, one of the statements I uh, recently met, it was probably two years ago, I met with somebody at a, a provost at American University and he was going on about how happy they were with this new arrangement they had signed with a company called 2U and uh, how pleased they were with this. And, and uh, my response was that every time I hear somebody sign, a university sign with that, to me that's an example of senior leaders saying we have to, you know, we should have been paying attention to this internet thing, we didn't pay attention to it, now we've got to buy our competency. We have to outsource what we should have developed internally, but that's just what we did. And uh, finally, last couple slides to go through, there is power of game, like pure and simple. What we're witnessing right now in education is a dramatic power struggle with those who would like to keep the university, higher education sector, even the K-12 sector, as it is, with those who would like to see it unbundled and would like to see it distributed so that there are new opportunities and new capacities for control and control structures to be created. So this unbundling, 
which we've done great for the last 15 years, we're now starting to see a rebundling of that starting to happen. And the rebundling will look a bit Frankensteinian in nature because it will include the traditional university sector as we have it now, but with a variety of other added providers where universities have outsourced recruitment, they've outsourced content development, they've outsourced uh, even assessment in some instances. So the rebundling that we're going to see in the next probably five to ten years is ultimately what's going to give us the shape of the school system that we have going forward in 2030. So at this point, that's sort of where I'd like to leave you with as a final slide is to think about the work of this forum is to understand and to realize by 2030 the decisions we're going to make in the next while are the ones that will give us the shape of the particular university system which is my focus. As I mentioned, Will will address data 12 in better detail than I have here. But it's, what does that look like? We know that things have been pulled apart. We know that the internet fragments, but we also know that the internet likes to, not after it's done fragmenting, it likes to pick a few big winners. And so what is that going to look like? And what kind of structure are we going to have when the university is no longer an end-to-end -end integrated system, but a system where you have a range of different technologies and different players that are involved in the part of the system? So on that note, we have about uh, five, ten minutes for questions, and then we'll get Will up here.